All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this Friday, February 19th, for another COVID uh, briefing. And um, we have a lot of guests on today and a lot to cover. Um, the, we're going we're gonna to share some good news about the number of Chittenden County residents, 75 and older, who have received the vaccine and really remind everyone, as I think we're going to be doing from, from here on out with this pandemic, that the vaccines are highly effective against death and serious illness. And really that is our most important message for, for this briefing that uh, Burlingtonian, we're urging Burlingtonians and Vermonters that if you are eligible, um, you should sign up and get the, the vaccine as soon as you can and to, to both to protect yourself and your loved ones. We also have some important updates to share about ongoing work with UVM and Champlain College to identify and contain positive cases. Uh, we're gonna talk about great work AgeWell um, has been doing, so we'll follow up to the segment we had last week to help homebound seniors access the vaccine and talk a little bit about our current um, efforts to mask essential workers. Uh, before we get to all that, before we do all that, I do wanna start by noting that Today marks exactly 11 months since the first confirmed fatality in Vermont of COVID-19. It is really pretty incredible to think that it's been nearly a year since the, uh, the coronavirus pandemic hit Vermont. And, and over that time, we have lost too soon so many of our family members, friends, and neighbors. Uh, today, we remember them and honor their memories. These, this 11 month anniversary also makes me reflect on the tremendous action that Vermonters and Burlingtonians have taken working together to slow the spread of the virus and prevent additional deaths. We see in other states how the country, uh, how much of a, and, you know, we, we see in other states and countrywide how much higher the toll can be. And I'm grateful for the efforts of Burlingtonians and Vermonters to contain the virus as much as we have and encourage everyone to keep it up in these critical weeks that remain between now and when all of the really uh, high, highly at risk Vermonters are vaccinated. Um, <clears throat> let's dive in now with a discussion with Dr. Stephen Leffler, the President and Chief Operating Officer of the UVM Medical Center, um, who is joining us once again to uh, share how uh, how things are going at the hospital and to review the current numbers, we can see that we've hit something of a plateau, even a, a slight increase in the number of uh, uh, new positives that we're seeing since last week. Um, Dr. Leffler, what do you make of this data and what's going on at the hospital? I mean, if you look across the country right now, Moreau, across the United States, COVID cases are actually declining pretty rapidly. They have been declining in Vermont as well, a little less quickly, but Vermont was starting at a much lower baseline. So small numbers in Vermont can make a big difference. Um, what I can tell you is the outbreaks we're having in our nursing homes, long-term care facilities, places like that have pretty much stopped since we've gotten those populations vaccinated. And so that is having a very positive impact on hospital capacity and overall deaths in Vermont. We've gotten um, many of the most vulnerable Vermonters already vaccinated and getting our 75 plus Vermonters, at least their first dose is another step 
to really keeping our, our most um, at-risk Vermonters safe. In the hospital today, we do have 11 COVID patients. Over the past week or so, we've been running around 10 to 12 in that range. That's less than it was three or four weeks ago when I was telling you we had 21 or 22. We do have five in our ICU today. That's a little higher than it's been, but we have plenty of beds, plenty of ventilators, plenty of capacity. So from a um, hospital capacity standpoint, we're in very good shape on COVID. The national trends are really quite striking. If we had the national graph up there, um, the, the peak has dropped from a mid-January peak of around uh, 330,000 infections a day down into the last few days. It's been in the you know, around 50 to 75,000 um, uh, cases one day to the next. Uh, so just a dramatic drop. Still a lot of uncertainty about what to uh, ascribe that to. Um, do you think when we are able to sort of do the full post-game analysis of this, uh, Dr. Leffler, that what you just mentioned, the, the initial vaccinations in those uh, high-risk facilities that had contributed to so many of the infections here in Vermont and nationally, do you think that that will be seen as, as being a, a very significant factor in this uh, positive current trend? Well, I think it will clearly be have shown to save lives. Yeah. That's where high amount of people are dying. So I think it's going to, yeah, without question, show that we saved um, across the country and in Vermont uh, many, many people's lives by doing it that way. I think that the um, downward um, trend in uh, COVID-19 is multifactorial. Part of its vaccines, and we're you know we're uh, the country's doing close to two million vaccines a day right now. That's really positive. Um, we do have in parts of the country, we do have people that have had a lot of people in some states have had COVID and have some immunity from that. Less in Vermont actually. Um, the weather is getting better across the country. There is seasonality to this, um, and so I, I do think there's multiple factors at play. But when you add them all up, it's very encouraging that we're moving in the right direction. So speed, let's stay on vaccinations a little bit. We've, even as we hit the 11 month mark of the pandemic today, we also reached two new milestones, hopeful milestones this week. First, 60% uh, of those 75 and older in Chittenden County have now had at least their first dose. Um, and we know that having a first dose really starts the process of uh, inoculation within a few days. And even just that first dose can provide significant protection. So 60% of Chittenden County residents 75 and older have hit that threshold. Um, monitoring and supporting this effort, um, however we can, is a, is a huge priority for the city and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Also this week, the state expanded the number of people who are eligible to receive the COVID-19 vaccine to the 70 and older category. And um, uh, my understanding is uh, half of those eligible have already signed up. Um, Dr. Leffler, what do you what do you make of these milestones? I mean, uh, no one wants to go faster in vaccinations than your healthcare providers, but <laughs> we are doing a good job. We're getting people vaccinated quickly and safely. Um, I saw data yesterday that about 15% of Chittenden County residents have at least have received at least one dose. 14% of all Vermonters have received at least one dose. Um, I've been sharing with you that at the medical center, over 90% of eligible staff have been fully vaccinated, over 90%. Um, I'm, I'm really proud of our staff. I can tell you without question now that anybody who needs care at the medical center, um, you're gonna be in a very safe environment. The, the chances of getting COVID markedly, it was great before because we've been following the protocols carefully, but really safe. And I, and I do think that should encourage other Vermonters, your healthcare professionals um, basically universally uh, want to be vaccinated. That's how confident they are that it's gonna help. One thing we've talked about before uh, on the briefing is just how remarkably effective these vaccines are um, and how some of the discussion about it has kind of understated that um, in that uh, I think it's underappreciated how almost basically for all intents and purposes, 100% of the people who get the vaccine are protected from death and serious illness. Almost no one in the clinical trials, I think one out of 75,000 people who received the uh, vaccine during the clinical trials ended up hospitalized. Um, nobody died as a result of side effects. Um, 
and yet sometimes we still hear effectiveness rates talked about is you know 90 percent or for some of the vaccines in a lower percentage that's effectiveness about any level of uh of of infection and and uh symptomatic um uh carrying of the the disease symptomatic symptomatic you know showing symptoms of covid do you, are you encountering confusion about this as you uh, as people come into the hospital, as people consider getting vaccinations, are you worried about people not understanding how effective these vaccines are? We have been talking about that a lot. And so, and you raise a really important point. The efficacy we should be talking about, the effectiveness we should be talking about is prevention of being hospitalized or death. And all five vaccines are equally effective at that. We haven't shown really any difference between the effectiveness of keeping you from getting very sick or dying. There seems to be some difference between getting a runny nose, but that really is not a huge issue for anyone. Most vaccines that we know about in the world, um, if they had efficacy rates as good as any one of these, they would be seen as some of the best vaccines ever. So I, I do want everyone listening today to understand that when you get, when it's your turn to get vaccinated, whatever vaccine is available that day, you should say yes and be thankful and know that getting that vaccine markedly reduces your risk of death or dying from COVID. So um, I think it's very likely that in the near future, we'll be getting Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is a great vaccine because it's one dose, which is great news. It's easy to store, which is great news, so it won't ever have to be wasted like we do with some of the more complicated ones. Um, and uh, it can be, uh, um, uh, it can travel throughout the rural parts of the state much easier than the more complicated Pfizer and Moderna. When that vaccine's in Vermont, I hope Vermonters line up in droves to get it when it's available because it will protect them from getting very sick from COVID. Good. I mean, I, Dr. Leffler, I almost feel like we're having an inverse issue with the beginning of the pandemic when um, there was this tendency in a lot of media accounts to, own, to suggest that it didn't matter if you got infected unless you died or were hospitalized, that it was only the most serious uh, cases that were treated as having any impact. Um, and there was sort of an understatement of the significance of, of infections. And now it's, uh, it feels to like the inverse of that. And, and it's harmful if, if people don't understand it. Anything that contributes to vaccine hesitancy um, uh, is, is, a, is, a, is something that can slow down um, the pace with which we get through this. And, and, and ultimately result in more, more deaths if there are people who should be, can be getting the vaccine who are, who are not getting it. Um, is, is there anything else on your mind today that you want to leave us with before we let you go? I want to let you know that, you know, uh, at the medical center, we've vaccinated more than 6,500 people um, without any serious side effects. And we've seen our staff infections. And what you should know is our staff are catching their infections in the community like everyone else because they are community members. And they've completely dropped off. We're not having any more staff infections. Um, and we're looking, and if you look at our nursing homes now, the infections have basically dropped to almost zero. And uh, that shows how well these vaccines are working. And uh, um, getting vaccine is not only good for you, it's good for the people that are around you. Um, without question, if you get very sick from COVID and you're coughing and sneezing, you can spread COVID. And they haven't 100% proved yet the vaccines don't prevent you from spreading it, but the evidence is getting better every day. And I think we're going to hear soon um, that they are confident in the protection of being vaccinated from spreading it. I think the news from the CDC last week that um, if you've been fully vaccinated and you're exposed to a COVID positive patient, you don't have to quarantine is very um, encouraging evidence. That the CDC does not believe you can spread COVID because if they thought you could, they would make you continue to quarantine. So I see that as the first step in the process of, of really being certain that COVID vaccine not only protects you, it protects people that you're with. That has, do you believe that that finding ultimately will probably take a little while to kind of uh, sugar off, but is going to, would, which should inform some of our other quarantine policies in terms of people who have been vaccinated traveling here and whether or not they need to continue to, to quarantine? Is, is that? Uh, the governor just announced, just announced a couple hours ago that if you've been fully vaccinated, um, you don't have to quarantine coming into or leaving Vermont or when you come back. Oh, that's and great. So I think that. So that, this is a risk of having the briefing on the same day as the governor talks. He, ju he just announced it because um, uh, I, I heard it from a number of people here. And okay. so to your point, um, that's, 
a very strong positive reason for people to get vaccinated. Um, the, That's the, a big deal, the big shift. Yep, and it proves the science is very confident um, in that your risk of spreading COVID goes way down after you've been vaccinated. Great. Well, let's let's hope there's real focus on that um, and not continued focus on this uh, increasingly smaller uncertainty uh, about a transmission risk um, when when you've been fully vaccinated. So great. Thank you, uh, Dr. Leffler, once again for for coming mm -hmm. on and helping us uh, understand uh, these these challenging times. And uh, thank you for everything that's that's happening. Um, my my awesome. pleasure. We'll see you soon. Very good. Okay, we're we're pleased now to to welcome um, back to the briefing uh, Wendy Koenig, who is the director of federal and state relations at the University of Vermont. I think we maybe need to add to that title, uh, Wendy, like uh, city relations too. <laughs> the amount of time you've been spending talking uh, city, city <laughs> maybe <team>. maybe true. <laughs> also, Gary Durr, uh, vice president for operations and public safety at UVM, uh, is with us, and Danelle. Barub, the Vice President for Student Affairs and Institutional Emergency uh, Management Coordinator at Champlain uh, College. Um, Danielle, uh, welcome back. I hope I didn't um, misstate your, your last name there. I think I, I hope I got the first name right this time. Um, no worries, no worries. Uh, so welcome back. Uh, they all joined, all three of these officials uh, joined us about a month ago on January 22nd in advance of the return of most students to the campus for the start of the spring semester. And now that we're several weeks into that semester, um, we wanted to in, invite you all back to uh, share an update on how things are going with respect to surveillance testing, identifying individuals who have contracted COVID-19, boxing in the virus, um, especially, uh, you know, I know we, uh, as anticipated, there has been a greater challenge in some ways uh, this semester, given the greater prevalence of, of the virus. So why don't we start with UVM, Wendy, Gary, um, uh, what can you share with us today? Uh, so thank you very much, Mayor. Um, I and we're happy to be back and be a part of this conversation here. Um, what you just said is exactly what we've experienced and what you confirmed with the chart that you showed in Chittenden County is that we are seeing a higher prevalence of positive cases on campus. Uh, we fully expected that. Uh, it is mirroring the trends uh, in Chittenden County in Vermont and across New England. Um, we feel confident about those numbers. We feel like we've got them under uh, control. Um, also, I think what it's important to remember, and you mentioned this as well too, the surveillance testing we're doing. And we continued that commitment and successful program that we had all of fall semester. We've been testing on average about 12,000 students a week. Uh, that gives us the ability to quickly identify individuals uh, who may test positive uh, and then work with them to isolate them, but also to do really effective uh, um, uh, contact tracing and working then to quarantine those individuals who may be close contacts that. The other thing uh, we mentioned earlier this week and we informed the folks is that we have testing available seven days a week uh, on campus. Our testing center is open Monday through Friday uh, and we've expanded those hours. We've expanded testing for those populations that work odd shifts like the late night shifts and they can't come in. Um, in the morning to do the tests. We've made tests available to them. But most importantly, we've also uh, adopted the use of the rapid testing, the antigen test, as a way to initially screen people who may be uh, symptomatic, who we're not sure what, they, what their uh, diagnosis might be, but it helps us identify those people that are uh, potentially positive and move them quicker into isolation while we wait for a conformatory uh, PCR test there. The other thing that, and this is a, a model that you used for the summer as well, which was really to uh, box in the cases. Um, we looked at our data recently, and what we found is that of our new positives, and this has continued since we shared this data, about 60% of our new positives came from students that were in quarantine already. Now, that might seem a little concerning, but on the other hand, that's really good, because these are students that were not out there, part of the population, and out on campus, they were already in quarantine and because they were exposed because of a close contact. And we moved those students then into isolation. And that trend seems to be continuing. And we're, we wish there were fewer of those, but at least we're glad to see that those people are contained in a quarantine situation there. 
Um, and that's, that's similar with the off-campus uh, uh, test results, but it's been a little bit smaller of a population in positive off-campus this semester. Um, the other thing that we have uh, done uh, is that we have been communicating regularly to our students about the importance of continuing the testing protocol, about the wearing of face coverings, personal hygiene, social gatherings, and just really sticking to those messages continuously. We sent a message out recently about um, being very mindful if you have symptoms, uh, to take those symptoms seriously and get tested. Uh, we communicated that, as, as you announced earlier this week, that the, uh, the, the more variant strain is in the area. We've not seen it on campus yet. We're thankful for that. Um, but we want to make sure that this is the time that students are all the more compliant with those protocols to make sure that we continue to have a safe semester. Thank you for that, Gary. Uh, you know, since, since you just raised that about the variant, um, and I know UVM has set up this kind of remarkable partnership with the Broad Institute to make this high level of testing happening. Are they, is, is there something beyond the state's level of genomic testing that that Broad partnership, and I'm, I'm genuinely, don't mean to spring an unexpected question on you, but I'm just, since you raised it, is that, is there, I know the state is taking certain additional steps to do additional genomic testing yeah. uh, because of the wastewater testing. Is the Broad able to help with that effort in any way? So, uh, excellent question. Uh, the Broad Institute actually did a lot during the month of January to expand its testing capacity. They added on additional staff, additional resources to um, significantly increase that capacity to process tests because they do them across all of New England. They also made it very, very clear that they're testing for all of the variants right now, including the, the, the new B17 variant, but also the South African variant. What we don't get is we don't get the breakdown of, of where the which variant it is that the person tests positive. If we choose to participate in the sequencing, we work with the Vermont Department of Health to do that sequencing to determine whether it's a particular variant or not. Okay. Okay. So the broad the broad testing just determines whether it's a positive or not of any right. type of variant. It doesn't say which variant it, it is. That's so correct. It, yeah. we we'll continue to be dependent on the on the state uh, the the state genomic testing to know whether it is one variant. Okay. That's correct. Um, great. Wendy, did you want to add anything to the UVM update or? Uh, or um, I, I think that Gary covered most of it. I'll just um, add uh, one thing that I think is important is that um, students have been required once again, coming back this semester to renew their commitment to the green and gold promise. So they did have to re-sign that commitment, which is um, part of the governor's restart requirements for higher ed, that we have um, a, a conduct um, pledge that people will follow the rules. And if they are not following their green and gold promise, they do go through the student conduct process at UVM very rapidly. So we are committed to, to that and students are committed to that. So we wanna thank them for, for being compliant and for um, renewing their commitment in that way. Great. Um, thank you, Wendy. Gary, um, Danelle, what, um, what would you like to share with us today? Sure. Well, first, again, thank you for the opportunity to come back and um, provide an update today. And um, again, you know, we want to express our appreciation to you and your team uh, for the leadership through this pandemic. Uh, we continue to be committed to working in partnership with the city and the states to ensure the health of our Burlington community, our neighbors, um, in addition to our students and our employees. At Champlain, we're now in week four of the spring semester with students back living and learning on campus. Um, and in planning for our students' return, we really uh, tried to build on the learnings of the success we had in the fall while making adjustments given the evolution of the virus uh, nationally and, and locally. Uh, we implemented a phased approach to our reopening for campus in the spring. For phase one, we were in a full campus quarantine as students returned, um, and we welcomed our undergraduate students back in two waves. Um, as you might remember, our first wave returned to us the weekend of January 23rd and 24th. Those students did quarantine on campus. Uh, upon arrival, they received day zero and day seven tests. They remained in quarantine until they re uh, received their negative test results from that day seven test. 
Um, and then during that process, we did discover three positive tests. So those students were, um, were moved to isolation, they were cared for from our health services team and contact tracing process was um, activated. Our second wave of students returned to us the, uh, February 4th and 5th. These students did complete a quarantine. They did that at home and we did require um, these students to conduct a pre-arrival test and submit a negative test result prior to their return. Um, and then when they did return, we also gave them a day uh, zero test upon arrival and they quarantined until they received a negative test result back. Um, for Champlain, our classes began on January 25th with the first two weeks being exclusively um, virtual. And after those two weeks on uh, February 8th, uh, we kind of entered phase two of our reopening. Um, and that, at that point, faculty uh, began offering in-person instruction and in-person services and activities um, became available. For example, students could begin occupying uh, our common spaces on campus while distanced and uh, wearing masks. Yesterday, we actually um, entered phase three where we um, offered students our definition of households that were specific to the wide variety of housing styles that we offer. Um, those definitions are, uh, of course, in alignment with the state guidance, but do give our students a little bit more um, interaction with their peers in the residence halls, um, which, which has been important. We continue to implement many of the measures that served us well in the fall. That includes um, continuing with a de-densification of our residence halls, the daily uh, health screenings, and then our weekly surveillance testing for all those living or interacting on campus. And of course, we continue to educate our students and enforce um, our, our health pledge. Um, at this point, we've conducted about 3,400 tests and have a positivity rate of 0.09%. Um, and again, uh, our three positives were from that first wave of students. And um, fortunately, we, we haven't had another positive yet. Um, you know, the other thing that I would offer too is that uh, we continue to post information on our website uh, and our COVID dashboard was recently reformatted. Um, our hope is that that really communicates uh, our information from our campus clearly to our community um, about where we're at this semester. And of course, we continue to monitor the national and local landscape of the virus and we'll continue to make any adjustments needed as, as we go along. Excellent. Thank you, Dana. Um, here are my, my thoughts on this um, after uh, my team uh, and I you know, looking at this, consulting with uh, with our partners, talking with uh, I talked with Dr. Levine about the uh, the the situation on the campuses um, yesterday, and you know basically here's where we're at. As a city, as we committed, we are following the testing numbers closely at UVM and Champlain, and we are in regular communication with with those parties I just listed. Higher case numbers than the fall semester are expected, as uh, as as Gary and Wendy indicated. Um, you know, just that is a function at some level of the higher prevalence of the virus now in in Vermont and in the community that it was last fall. Um, even so, uh, forty six positive cases uh, in a week between February eighth and February fourteenth is is notable, certainly in contrast to the fall, and we're continuing to monitor closely the efforts of the, both colleges to identify and contain the virus. Um, for now, the indicators that we're really focused on are the rate at which positive cases are increasing. We're focused on UVM and Champlain quarantine capacity um, and indications that the colleges are taking appropriate and swift disciplinary action as they did in the fall, if warranted. Um, of course, this could change at any time. Uh, we know we know that uh, a, a kind of hallmark of this virus uh, has been that conditions can shift rapidly. But um, right now, from our perspective, this number is still a very small percentage of uh, the campus populations. Um, Forty-six students out of ten thousand uh is a very very low positivity rate and lower than the overall state average so we're, we're seeing it in that context again the city is going to continue to track this uh closely um uh, particularly uh through these critical weeks um that coincides with the early part of the semester while we are working to get um all of the population 65 and older uh vaccinated which is 
um, the great majority of the really at risk uh, population for this vaccine. So for, uh, for the virus. Um, I'm going to move on now. I think uh, our partners are going to stick around. I know this has been this been media interest in this issue. I know there may be questions about this. Let me just hit a couple of other quick updates before we um, uh, before we uh, take questions. Um, first, uh, I want to share an update and, and thank you, Brian Lowe has joined us, our, our COVID-19 leader and CIO. Um, Last week we had an update. Uh, we had Agewell on the briefing and um, shared really. Uh, they want to make make sure the community was aware of this robust helpline for seniors uh, that they have for a variety of issues, including vaccination issues. And we really encourage people who are homebound or struggling with transportation issues to get in touch with Agewell. And thank you to the media for helping us publicize and spread the word of that. Um, hotline. There it is again, 800-642. I just lost it. 5119. And I um, uh, wanted to give an update on this. Since last week, AgeWell received 44 calls. Uh, it's helpline from older adults uh, in Chittenden County who had not yet registered for a vaccine uh, because they were unable to leave their homes and get to a clinic. And AgeWell really acted on those phone calls and over they were able to find a way for over half of those callers to find transportation and register for a vaccination clinic uh, through the Department of Health. For the remaining callers, the AgeWell helpline team was able to take their information and coordinate with UVM Home Health and Hospice and Garnet Transport Medicine to sign them up to receive an in-home vaccination. And these home vaccinations in Chittenden County have now begun. Uh, overall, in recent weeks, AgeWell has proactively called nearly 2,500 older Vermonters and 342 additional Burlington residents to make sure that they know they are eligible and to see what questions they have uh, about the uh, vaccination process. We're really trying, AgeWell is trying uh, to um, ensure that people don't have uh, vaccine hesitancy that's not grounded in, in the facts and in the science. The city is working with AgeWell on even more ways uh, to reach Burlingtonians who are eligible for the vaccine. And we're gonna have AgeWell come back on the briefing next week to, to share more about those additional efforts that uh, we are getting underway. Um, one thing, I that the city is doing in consultation with our other area senior providers is sending out a pushcard to every residence in Burlington in multiple languages as another way to make sure that we reach those who are not on the internet or don't have social, you know, not using social media or who don't, don't speak English. Um, and the feedback we've been getting has been positive. Senior prov providers have emphasized the postcards from the city or the ads that we've been running in the newspapers, the North Avenue News in seven days are helpful way, ways to reach older residents. And this complements the extensive outreach the city and many, many partners like AALV, USCRI, Vermont, and others are doing uh, to reach out to our non-English speaking populations and advocate for, um, for them and, and to support them in additional ways. Um, Another update we want to share is that last week, the city's wastewater monitoring program had identified two mutations that indicate the B117 variant of COVID-19. Brian uh, Lowe, again, is with us. Brian, what can you tell us about additional wastewater testing since last week? Hey, thanks, Mayor. Um, you can see here on the attached image that overall, by and large, the trend line across the city has been down. Um, it's very hard to tell at the, at the tail end there if it's stabilizing or if it's starting to go in an upward trend, but we'll know more soon. Um, we did actually just get additional wastewater results in there, um, and we do have some indication that overall levels continue to fall, but there's now um, a sign of those mutations in both our north and east plants. Excuse me, both our main and east plants. Thank you, Brian. Um, the third update I wanted to share was on the city's efforts to distribute face masks to essential workers. We shared on the briefing last week 
that uh, the city has procured an additional 3,000 high quality face masks from Masking for Good Vermont. Um, this is in addition to the 26,000 masks that we fabricated in partnership with uh, a variety of community organizations last um, spring. And um, we have been distributing these to essential workers in the city. Uh, as, you, as people are aware, the vaccination strategy here in Vermont, which I support, is to vaccinate uh, uh, by age priority, not by the priority around um, uh, essential workers. Um, and given that, and given that it may be as a result, you know, some months before all of our essential workers uh, have received the vaccine, we wanted to put additional effort into making sure that all Burlington essential workers now had these high quality masks available to them. And we have distributed 838 of this new uh, shipment of 3000 to 20 different organizations that deploy essential workers. Um, and that does include, uh, that's in addition to um, uh, city departments also using some of these masks. Um, and that is a photo there of uh, this one of the city teams delivering masks on North Street earlier this week. This is Graham Peterson of our Burlington City Arts team, um, as well as Marielle Matthews, who is recently hired as the city's public health equity manager. And we're pretty excited to have uh, added her capacity uh, to the team. Brian, you want to add anything about, about this effort or anything else? No, it's, uh, it's going well. Uh, we know we will have hundreds of more masks out um, in the near future. If folks um, are working at a business or um, running a business and want additional masks for their employees, um, the number for the uh, Resource and Recovery Center is there, 802-755-7239. Um, and we're also proactively calling um, businesses across the community um, and delivering. So thank you, Mayor. Awesome. All right, great. We, we have one other uh, topic we just wanted to update on that is COVID related. Catherine Shad, our Chief Administrative Officer who oversees elections, um, I believe is, is with us. And Catherine, what, what can you share with folks about where we are? What are we doing differently this election and where, where are we in that process? Thank you, um, Mayor. I am pleased to say uh, that it should be easy for our voters to understand because this a town meeting day, the election is gonna work exactly like the November election for Burlington voters. Um, we mailed everyone who was an active registered voter a ballot uh, last week. You should have received it this week. If you don't get it by today um, and you feel that you should have, please call or email the clerk's office. Um, if you have received it and you want to participate in absentee voting, um, you can return that ballot by mail. Please get it in the mail by Monday or Tuesday of next week so we can make sure it's received in time. You can also drop it at any one of four of the city's drop boxes. Those are located outside of City Hall, at the Department of Public Works, at 645 Pine Street, at Fire Station Number 2 on North Avenue, and also at the Miller Center. Um, you can also drop them on the first floor of City Hall, during regular business hours, if you would like to physically hand it to a person. City Hall is closed uh, for business, but we have a security guard who uh, will take it from you and put it into a box while you watch. Um, if you would rather go to a polling place, we will have those open as usual. They will be safe. You will wear a mask. We will make sure everything is sanitized. Those will be open 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. If it's possible, please bring the ballot that we sent with you. You can fill it out ahead of time and just drop it. If that does not work for you or you lose that ballot, you can just come, we'll give you one there. And if you still need to register to vote, same day voter registration is available. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to call the clerk's office or as you can see here, there is a website and there is a lot of information there. 
Awesome, Catherine. Thank you for all the additional work that you and your team are doing to make uh, this local election happen smoothly like last November's general election. Um, appreciate the that not only are you making it possible for people to vote in all these different ways, but that Vermont's incredible ethic of allowing people to uh, register to vote up into and including election day is being maintained. Um, so well, what does someone do if they uh, want to vote early? They don't want to. They don't want to go to the polls on election day, but they haven't registered yet. What 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 do we recommend those people do? If you go to that website, um, you can actually register to vote online. Um, and if you do that anytime up until the 24th, we can still mail that ballot to you. We'll do that automatically. Um, if that doesn't work for you, you can print that out and you can mail it back to us. If that doesn't work or you don't have a printer, just call us up at City Hall and we will find another way. That's great. Thank you again, you and our uh, elections uh, uh, clerk, uh, Amy Bovey, for um, everything that you guys have done to make good on this idea that voting should be um, as easy as possible for as many people as possible. And um, uh, let's, uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's hope the rest of it goes goes smoothly. And um, oh, I, I and 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 in addition, um, finding a way to minimize the impact on on any local budgets by going out and, and finding grant funds uh, to to help with these additional measures. So it's uh, it, it's been really appreciated. Thank you. All You're right, welcome. with that, um, Olivia, we'd be happy to answer uh, any questions that there are. Great. So a reminder for members of the media who are called in, you can let me know that you have a question just by emailing me. And the first up is Erin from WCAX. Erin, you should be able to enable your microphone. Hi, Mayor Weinberger. C can you hear me? I can, Erin. Go ahead. All right. Um, so yeah, we just wanted to talk about um, the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance and their recent demand um to change the champlain parkway they're claiming that it would negatively impact uh bipoc and low-income neighborhoods um sp specifically in the maple and king areas um so we just wanted to um see what your response is to that and if you think that their claim is um fe feasible and that it'll um you know that, that their that their um demands can be met Great, Aaron. Thanks for the question. So, um, so this is a question that we have just spent the recent um, uh, extended period, going back months, uh, I believe, all the way back to last summer or certainly the fall, um, studying and uh, as required by this federal process. And the uh, report that is coming out of that, the the experts um, don't agree with that statement. Basically, the experts find that. This is an area that is um, already impacted significantly by, by traffic. Um, and what the Champlain Parkway does is actually improve elements of that. It, it will, it stops all the idling and stopping and starting um, that happens at a couple of key intersections there and by installing um, traffic lights there, uh, in many ways it will improve and lessen the impacts in a variety of ways. Uh, of, uh, of vehicles in that area. We do agree with, and have really the city has long agreed going back 15 years with the idea that there's a better way to deal with transportation issues in that area that would actually improve um, the current situation for some uh, neighborhoods in, in, in that, that are near, that are adjacent to the Champlain Parkway. And that is why we have been pursuing for some time the rail yard enterprise project and why we've been why we've been fighting to keep that project moving forward when that project is built, it will actually improve the current conditions uh, in the area and the conditions that will exist uh, after the Champlain Parkway is built, it is a separate project but it is a near very nearby uh, area and I'm pleased to say that there is. Um, uh, we've reached a significant milestone in that part project recently and, and uh, that 
we are working with the state and federal partners to move that project as quickly as possible. And um, uh, we hope that the as these conversations continue, that the you know that we can be aligned with the Racial Justice Alliance on that um, separate uh, but important project and a project that deals with some of these same issues. All right. Thank you very much. That's my only question. Thank you, Erin. Great. Uh, next question is from Katya from VT Digger. Katya, you should be able to enable your microphone. Great. Thank you. Can you hear me? Hi, Katya. Hi. Can you hear me okay? I'm having trouble hearing you, just so you know. I don't know. If, sounds like you're kind of muffled. Yeah, I've been having some sound troubles. How is it now? That's much better. That's much Great. better. I'm like lifting my laptop <laughs> up to talk into it. Um, I have a question about UVM. So I don't know if uh, folks from the schools are still on the call um, or for you, Mayor, as well. Um, so I know on Monday, the city council passed a resolution that asked, among other things, um, to increase the amount of time. Uh, can you hear me still? Mm -mm. No, no, we can't. Mm. I'm gonna email Olivia my question. <laughs> that sounds good, thanks Kat. Yeah, I will read it out as soon as I get that. All right, one second. And we don't have any other questions at the moment. Um, so let's uh, just give Katya a minute to write the question out. Okay, I sent it, so it should be should be with you, Olivia. Perfect. Yes, I have it. Uh, so Katya's question is: Does UVM intend to increase COVID data reporting after the after Monday City Council resolution that requested that, and would the mayor support that also? So our plans are to continue to report on Monday like we have all of fall semester. Katya, from my perspective, you may remember there we had discussions um, about uh, the data issues back in the in the fall, and um, I was ultimately satisfied, and am satisfied by the combination of uh, weekly reporting um, and daily re uh, reporting into the, the the state system. So UVM tests are, are captured in those uh, daily updates that uh, we have on. Um, you know, cumulative uh, Chittenden County numbers and statewide numbers um, combined with the additional, you know, the, the commitment which UVM has made good on of consultation with the city uh, whenever there are emerging issues. So I, I'm satisfied uh, with the current situation. Uh, as noted before, we are watching very carefully this higher level of infections and um, uh, we'll continue to be in close consultation with UVM and the state and Champlain College uh, as the semester continues. All right, Olivia, that's... Uh, that's yes, uh, that's all the questions we have. Okay, thank you everyone for joining us today. I uh, wish everyone a good weekend. We expect to be back again next week with, a, with another update. And uh, until then, stay safe, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.